The next item of business is members' business debate on motion 15906 in the name of Maurice Corrie on financial scam prevention. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Maurice Corrie to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am very grateful to open the members' debate tonight uh, this, uh, and uh, to talk about the subject that's in hand. And thank you to the members who supported my motion so fervently, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, how many among you have received an email from a foreign royal claiming you are the only one capable of helping them out of a sticky situation, uh, usually involving thousands of pounds, or an offer of, to invest in gold that will make you richer uh, than you ever dreamed of in a matter of days? or received a call claiming your car insurance is overdue when you haven't even got a car. It is also sure that, almost sure that all of us have been exposed to financial scams throughout our lives. And while some of these scams are more obviously fraudulent, scammers are getting more and more sophisticated in their targeted attacks. And I particularly had one only the other day which lasted from Friday until Monday. Uh, where the, the purporting to be BT clearly were phoning from Bombay or somewhere over that part of the world and it took us till Monday to identify that it was actually fraudulent and when I then said could you tell me where you're calling from and they said 81 High Hoburn in London I said that's fine I'll just pass that to the police they'll be around and all I got was oh my god and the phone went down on, and then never heard from them again so basically um, they are really at it and in short uh, we are all exposed to scams and there are simple preventative measures to protect the safety of our communities and these are the, there are vulnerable members of our communities at risk and we need to implement preventative measures to protect them from scamming and the basics are simple financial scams are costing UK consumers nine billion pounds a year and this coupled with the fact that one in eight Scots will fall victim to fraud indicates that a serious public security issue exists Financial scams manifest themselves in a variety of ways, and a phishing scams, fraudulent calls, bogus callers, rogue traders at the doorstep, and scammers pose as banks, HMRC, pension funds, and other reputable institutions. And make note, your bank will not send you anything requesting personal information that is riddled with spelling errors. And these are scams that are a matter of community safety, and £350 million, pounds, no less, was lost last year from customers being tricked into transferring money into fraudulent accounts. And with our vulnerable population, unfortunately, it is often the more vulnerable members of our communities who fall, uh, fall victim to these crimes. And fortunately, there are simple ways to prevent anyone from falling victim to scams and to keep our communities safe. Scammers target the socially isolated, those with dementia, pensioners, and others. And for some who come for, who came from a time when most correspondents could be trusted, rogue trailers, traders appear to be legitimate, and a phone call from the bank requesting funds seems genuine. There is a strong correlation between social isolation and falling victims to scams, and seven out of, eight, uh, seven out of ten victims of scams do not tell anyone about it and are thus unable to be helped. There are currently 3.6 million older people living alone in the UK, two million of which are over 75. And of course, not all older, people, all older people will fall victim to scams, but we must punish those who target their perceived vulnerability. And in their 2017 report, Age Scotland shared a case study that I feel illustrates how one financial scammer targeted those who are socially isolated. John is a proud retired professional who is living independently with dementia. His wife died several years ago, and his only daughter lives 30 miles away. And one day, a home carer noted that some men were working on the roof of his property. Turns out they had cold call that after noticing a loose roof tile on John's house. They initially quoted 80 pounds, but have since claimed that the roof needed emergency repairs and the cost had rocketed to 7,500 pounds. John was upset and confused and indicated that he just wanted to pay the men to get them away as he felt threatened and embarrassed. And the home carer contacted the police and trading standards scam prevention team and the alleged workmen cleared off when they realized that the police were investigating. And the Trading, uh, trading Standards Scam Prevention Team then visited John to give him advice on avoiding scammers in the future. It happened that John was also being targeted by scammers on the phone and through large amounts of mail claiming he had won various prizes. And sadly, John had responded to a number of these fraudsters and over 100,000 pounds of his savings had been withdrawn from his account to pay scammers from all over the world. And what happened to John is unfortunate and totally unacceptable. 
and gratefully his local trading standards scam prevention team visited John to ensure he wasn't scammed again, but the damage already been done. And now it is indeed a sad story, but it, is hi it has highlighted the ways in which we can deal with and prevent these scams. While Westminster is officially charged with consumer rights, these scammers are a threat to the Scottish community's safety. We, are a, we have a responsibility to the Scottish Parliament, in the Scottish Parliament to protect our citizens from harm, including financial harm. And the Scottish Police and the Trading Standards Scotland are essential in targeting these scammers. Let us work with them and support the local trading standards, standards community and the community safety focused scam prevention work that they undertake. And sadly, trading standards are recognised as being at breaking point in terms of funding and low staff numbers. However, several local authorities have induced, introduced creative prevention initiatives to reduce the risk of residents being scammed. And this creativity is to be commended. Initiatives including blocking nuisance calls and BT has found that the average British person receives four nuisance calls a week. And what can be a nuisance call to some or a near miss, in my case, can be a devastating financial blow to others. And through nuisance call blocking initiatives, over 1.5 million calls have been blocked across Scotland. And with increased awareness, only more nuisance calls will be blocked, protecting the public from parting ways with their savings. The Life Changes Trust should also be recognised for funding trading standards in East Renfrewshire, Angus and South Ayrshire. And they aim to increase awareness about the simple practical solutions to prevent scams amongst those who are living with dementia. And this project is in its third year and has helped hundreds of families living with dementia to avoid scams and unwanted cold callers. And feedback shows an increase in confidence and ability to maintain an independent life. And one recipient of the call blocker said, months ago I was distressed by nuisance calls and so I'm so glad I have the call blocker. Another said, it's amazing how it has worked. We used to receive several calls a day and now none. The Life Changes Trust simple project has restored the peace of mind to 805 households since 2013, preventing up to an estimated of 2 million in financial loss being prevented. And trading standards are an integral part of preventing these financial scams. And Deputy Presiding Officer, the financial scam prevention can be simple. Beyond call blocking, local police in Aberdeen have used their monthly bulletin to warn residents of rogue traders and bogus callers. And this grassroots effort utilises existing channels in a cost-effective way to prevent scams. The police in Dumbarton organised a walkabout to raise awareness after a local pensioner was scammed out of a four-figure sum. And the commitment of Dumbarton police is to be commended in their efforts to prevent those instances from continuing and providing no, call, no cold call, calling stickers on doors and a, a list of local trusted traders are another simple way to prevent financial scams. Unfortunately, even when someone is completely aware of the risk, they will choose to talk to scammers because it's better than having no one. And this is tragic to me, as I hope that as Parliament will increase our efforts to be for a more connected Scotland, and there are befriending networks, community classes, men's sheds, and a plethora of third sector programs to, contact, to, con, sorry, to combat uh, social isolation. And let me touch on John's story once more. After suffering his £100,000 loss, the Trading Standards uh, Scam Prevention Team in his local council helped in a number of ways. John's daughter became his power of attorney for welfare and financial matters. He received a free nuisance calls blocker to stop all unwanted scam and sales calls and a no cold call sticking on his door, sticker on his door. His mail was redirected to his power of attorney and a list of trusted traders was supplied to him and his family for future use. And finally, John has joined a local supported art class and feels less isolated and his anxiety levels are drastically reduced. Let us prevent the need for anyone to feel the need to trust foreign princes with their money. In conclusion, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, preventing financial scams is imperative to community safety. And with technology and likewise scams becoming more sophisticated every year, we must protect our citizens. Then the new Economic Crime Strategic Board is working with senior figures from the UK financial sector to tackle these, these scams. And we must not wait. May we support our local councils, police and trading standards, prevent and deal with the financial scams. The issue is costing us, not just in pounds sterling, but in peace of mind of our citizens. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Corey. Um, speeches of four minutes, please. <laughs>
And I call on Ruth McGuire to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, can I begin by thanking Maurice Corrie for securing this debate on scam awareness. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. That's a phrase that comes up repeatedly when looking at financial scams and how to prevent them. And it's a phrase that came up repeatedly at the tail end of last year at a scam awareness surgery I organised in my constituency. Experts from Citizens Advice Scotland, Trading Standards, Police Scotland and Better Off North Ayrshire all came along with information and advice on what to look out for and what to do in order Excuse to... Excuse me, Ms McGuire, could you pull your microphone towards you a little? Okay. I think that might be better. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, a key message to come out from that surgery was that anyone can fall for a scam, but you have a better chance of staying safe from fraudsters if you know what to look out for. So that means being wary of unexpected visitors at the door collecting for charity but with no proof of identity, or a passing trader who knocks on the door to say that your roof is missing a few slates, but whose bill to fix that rises from £80 to several thousand after he notices that extensive repairs are needed, or pushy salespeople who ring with great discounts on new windows but put pressure on for quick decisions so victims don't do proper checks. Then there are those who use sub subterfuge and trickery to extract personal details from you or who impersonate your bank or empty your account. Mm -hmm. There are signs that many of these messages are being taken on board. Just recently, a gentleman visited my office to let us know that he'd been approached on the doorstep by someone claiming to be a contractor for a local housing association doing work in the area and offering to install cavity wall insulation on his property just while they were in the area, you understand. He was immediately suspicious and sought our help in checking it out. We made some inquiries which suggested that this was most unlikely. Trading standards were informed and my constituent was able to avoid what was almost certainly a dodgy deal. Spotting and stopping financial scamming requires that all of us to do that be and remain vigilant. It puts pressure on our local authorities, police and charities such as Citizens Advice who need to keep up to date with the latest scams to help people avoid them and deal with the consequences when far too often we do. The cost of vigilance can be considerable, but the price of failing to be vigilant is heartache, misery, and in some cases, financial ruin. Presiding officer, I'll just close where I opened. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Jackie Bailey, followed by Richard Lyle. Presiding officer, can I also join with others in thanking Maurice Corrie for bringing this debate to the chamber and as his motion rightly points out financial scamming and the effect that it has on both an individual and a community is a serious issue of public safety. Scamming someone out of their hard earned money is certainly not a new phenomenon but with modern technology scamming has become more prevalent and embedded in our day to day lives. Anyone can be conned out of money. However, the sad reality is that some in society are more vulnerable than others, and they unfortunately become targets. Many of those who are scammed lose thousands of pounds, and many never see that money again. In more serious cases, financial scams even mean that people have been forced to sell their home and declare bankruptcy. As Maurice Corey rightly said, when one in eight people across Scotland are victims of scams, and there is an estimated nine billion loss to the UK, it is shocking and I don't think we discuss this issue enough. Let me paint a picture though. Your favorite band has announced that they will be playing near you. You've been waiting years to see them. You saved up all your money in order to buy the often quite expensively priced ticket. Devastatingly, the tickets sell out in a matter of minutes. Your one final ditch attempt is to head to the venue on the night of the concert to see if there are any last minute tickets going spare and it's your lucky day. You pay the inflated price of the ticket to the kind individual who'd happen to have a ticket going spare, only to find that your ticket is fake, the seller has vanished, and when you attempt to get into the venue, you are denied access. That is becoming far too regular an occurrence, and in the cases of music concerts and festivals, it's often young people on low incomes who've saved up for that ticket that are left out of pocket. These fake ticket scams are also happening online, with many second-hand ticket websites scamming customers out of the price of a ticket, which sometimes never, ever arrives. 
Some scammers will create an almost identical website to the original one with only slight differences, such as the URL having .net instead of .com. Um, and when the website asks the unsuspecting customer for their bank details to complete an online purchase, indeed. Alistair Allen. Thank the member for giving way. Um, the member rightly points out that um, websites can, of course, be, be fake. I'm sure she'll also agree that one of the, the growing problems, and I've certainly experienced uh, this in my, my own surgeries, is that paper invoices can be faked on the basis of intercepted emails as well, and people can actually receive invoices which look convincing but have the wrong bank account details on them through the post. Jackie Bailey. Um, yes, I think that's absolutely right. And in fact, my recollection is um, there was a, a period not that long ago where MSPs indeed received similar um, fake emails with invoices attached. Um, so you cannot just rely on whether it's on a website, whether it comes by email, or indeed whether some of this is face-to-face. -face. Now, those sort of scams that are related to emails and websites would have probably been quite rare two decades ago. Um, they're now far too commonplace. But scams also take place face-to-face. -face. One of my constituents in Dumbarton was recently conned out of 9,000 pounds and left with a damaged roof. Now, it seems that roofs are a particular theme. But according to my constituent, a man approached his house, offered to carry out seemingly essential work on his roof. All he needed was £9,000 up front to carry this out. Once paid, the scammer was never seen again. Nobody is immune to scams, and we must do more to encourage the public to be vigilant in every aspect of their daily lives. Another of my constituents, an elderly pensioner in Dumbarton, was conned out of £2,000 after he, re he received a phone call from someone claiming to be his bank, stating that there was a problem with his account. Understandably, he followed the advice of the caller as he thought it was his bank, and he paid £2,000 to rectify a problem that simply didn't exist. And can I associate myself with the remarks made by Maurice Corey about Dumbarton Police and indeed all of L Division who are working hard to make residents aware of scams. In closing, presiding officer, it is never the fault of those victims that have been scammed. When someone tells you, who's often very plausible, they tell you that they can help you, what reason would you have for not believing them? We need to use all the tools at our disposal, awareness raising, legislation and enforcement to crack down on the culprits of these financial scams because they can't be allowed to get away with this any longer. Richard Lyle, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. Can I uh, thank Maurice Corey for uh, bringing this important issue to debate today in the Members' Debate. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this important debate on financial scam prevention. I want to begin my contribution by stating clearly that I believe we are facing a great problem in regard to financial scamming. Many of our citizens and senior citizens are vulnerable to dangers. We need to take appropriate measures to minimise the effects that it has on the lives of people and ensure that we are making progress to put an end to financial scamming. Financial scamming is something that could happen to anyone. We live in a world of technology and it makes it easier for scammers to take advantage of people. It is for this reason that it's vital for us to continue to push agendas and proposals that will make it harder for the scammers to reach their goal. As convener of the cross-party group in Dementia, I had the opportunity to learn about the financial scam. Paul Holland, a member of the prevention team for East Renfrewshire Council, a member of the cross-party group in Dementia, is an advocate for those affected by financial scam. According to him, as Maurice Correa already has said, it's estimated that there are £9 billion lost to scams in the UK each year. This statistic speaks volume to the problem that we are facing. We need to continue to support lo local organisations that are doing indispensable work to help people who are harmed by financial scam. As noted, anyone can be a victim to financial scam. But the population of older adults are the people who are often the targets, including those with the de dementia. We want to care and provide for these people. We want to continue to give them the tools to live independently and free from the worry that might affect from a financial scam. The Financial Conduct Authority is an organisation that helps with the harms of financial scam and they've put a great emphasis on that all unexpected calls, emails, text messages should be treated with caution. The people behind these scams are often people who know basic information about their target. Last week, I actually was sent an email, an email 
to tell me that my parliamentary email had won $1 million. I didn't reply. The evolution of this threat calls for different answers to fight against financial scams. In fact, the increase in the number of financial scams has proliferated in parallel with the growth of IT, information technology. Email and hacking scams have replaced telephone and postal scams. This new threat affects all age groups, from the youngest to the oldest population. And therefore, we should establish techniques of prevention that fit the needs of our different profiles of our population. Moreover, we have to continue to take steps against, to fight against professional scammers. As the Justice Committee under, underlines, the first step to be taken is to support those who have been victims of scams through guidance. For the younger generation, this prevention can be enhanced through education. It's imperative for the younger generation to continue to develop computer skills at school. This type of education can help prevent exposures to scams on the internet. Teaching young people to recognise internet, internet scams appears to be an, an essential solution to avoid scams. As for the older adults, we should uh, consider training them on digital tools to prevent financial scams. Maybe I should take that up also. The development of new technologies is occupying an increasing important place in our lives. It constitutes a real digital revolution. However, because of the derivatives that are, we are able to generate, we should be able to understand the importance of the efficiency of prevention. To conclude, I want to underline that protection from abuse and financial scams is a fun fundamental right that our older adults have. Elder sc scam is a human rights violation and infringement of Article 25 of the EU Charter of fun uh, Fundamental Rights. I don't know if I can say that nowadays. Which uh, recognises and respects the rights of older people to lead lives of dignity and independence, to freely participate in a social and cultural life. The fight against financial scams will not be solved in a single day, but a long work of prevention against the risks risk seems more necessary than ever. Can I thank again uh, Maurice Corey for bringing this really important issue uh, to this uh, uh, chamber today. Thank you. Jeremy Balfour, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, Age UK has described fraud as a challenge we face as a whole society and has been identified as one of the most numerous types of crime. Fraud is a crime in which some kind of deception is used for personal gain and can be a devastating effect on a person's life. Not only can fraud leave people penniless, it can have serious long-term lasting consequences on their health and well-being. Fraudsters are becoming increasingly sophisticated and can scam people by post, phone, online or in person. And it is important that we raise awareness of these schemes to prevent more people's lives being affected by those who make their job to con people out of their hard-earned money and life savings. Whilst fraud is a crime that affects people of all ages, older people are often more at risk because of their circumstances. As we've heard already, their isolation, their lonely, their mental decline, and they're more likely to respond to scams. In indeed, two-fifths of older people in Scotland, amounting to 400,000 people, believe they, believe they have been targeted by a scam in the last 12 months. They are also more likely to be vulnerable to particular types of fraud, like doorstep, phone scams and pension scams. For example, again, Age UK report on scamming noted that the average age of victims of mass marketing poster fraud is 75 plus. This includes lottery and prize scams and scams which often seem so legitimate that people take them forward. That is why it is important that all people, but particularly older people, are educated on the ways to determine scams of all kinds. There are charities and organisations that can provide helpful information and advice, like Friends Against Scams. Friends Against Scams is a national trade and standard scams team which aims to protect and prevent people from becoming victims of fraud by empowering individuals and communities to take a stand against it. Here in Edinburgh, the City Council has partners with organisations 
and with staff undertaking French pledges as a method to spread awareness of scamming in hope of having a domino effect across the city. Other charities such as Aid Scotland and Think Jessica have helplines available for anyone affected by a scam, whilst it's encouraging to report a scam to the police in order to help their fraud team tackle the problem. Aidit is a charity, again based here in Edinburgh, that provides community-based computer training for those over 50, seeking to encourage new and non-confident users to learn basic computer skills and, again, work out what is a scam and what isn't. There is help out there, but we need to make sure that people know about it. I think we need to encourage people to speak with their loved ones, friends and neighbours about the different types of scams that are out there and that they perhaps have fallen into the trap of going down. I would also like finally to take this opportunity to ask the Scottish Government to undertake more detailed research to understand the extent and impact of fraudulent schemes and to do what they can to make sure that people are aware of what is going on. Because without public safety campaigns, without people talking about it, more and more people will be affected by this. Can I conclude by thanking uh, my colleague for bringing forward uh, this members debate tonight. And I think it is a vital subject that we shouldn't be scared to talk about, but we should be shouting from the rooftops, don't do it. Thank you. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Gail Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate Maurice Corey for securing debating time on an important issue which has concerned me for many years. I previously ran an extensive information campaign in my constituency on this very topic. It's estimated that over a quarter of a million people in Scotland fall victim to scams each year, losing hundreds if not thousands of pounds. And in 2017, the average loss for scam victims aged 75 to 79 was four and a half thousand pounds. Scams annually cost the Scottish economy between 500 million and one billion pounds. And the Office for National Statistics found that people are more likely to fall victim to fraud or cyber offences than any other crime. Sadly, older people are overrepresented as victims, including pension, telephone and doorstep scams, being targeted due to perceived vulnerability. The average victim is 75. Older people living alone are more likely to be scammed than married people, and half of all people aged 75 plus live alone. Tragically, victims are often lonely, and the criminal is the only friend they have. Scammers may also intimidate and bully victims into parting with savings. The stress and pain of victimisation can seriously impact lives and cause depression, isolation from family and friends and a serious deterioration of physical and mental health. People defrauded in their own homes are two and a half times more likely to die or go into residential care within a year. Victims may go through many reactions and emotions including anger, flashbacks, nightmares, fear of leaving the house, confusion and anxiety. The entire experience can be extremely traumatic and enduring. Older people are also more likely to suffer repeat scams. This could be because they are over-trusting, socially isolated, or suffering from dementia. Chronic victims often refuse to believe they are being scammed and spend huge amounts of time reading, sorting, and replying to scam letters. Even when someone recognises they have been scammed, they may be too embarrassed to seek help or talk about it, and it is believed that only 5% of scams are reported, and 7 out of 10 victims don't tell anyone, including friends and family. But it is important to emphasise the victims of scamming need not feel embarrassed or ashamed. People from all walks of life and all ages can be scammed. There are groups and services available who not only try to stop future scamming activities, but provide support to victims. One important group is Think Jessica, a charity committed to protecting elderly and vulnerable people from fraud. Victim Support Scotland and Citizens Advice Scotland also deliver vital support and offer guidance on where to turn. While Victim Support Scotland doesn't offer counselling, they can help people understand and cope with their feelings. Victims often find it easier to speak with someone impartial than family and friends. They listen, give people time to talk and begin to understand the impact a scam has had on them, as well as to help identify and agree on further support that may be required. Behind each scam lies heartbreaking stories of people and their families being robbed of their entire life savings, as Maurice Corey outlined with John. 
Presiding officer, this government's National Nuisance Calls Action Plan contains a range of measures to raise awareness and is welcome in making it easier for people to protect themselves. However, the power to regulate in this area still lies with the UK government, which I'm delighted to say finally agreed to implement Patricia Gibson MP's Nuisance Calls Director Level Responsibility Bill after an unnecessary three-year delay. When the bill was introduced on 13 September 2015, only companies could be fined, meaning that company directors simply closed down the company upon which the fine had been levied and reopened under a different company name whilst retaining the same staff and premises trading as before. The bill seeks to tackle the scourge of nuisance calls by legislating for company directors to be fined up to half a million pounds each if they are found to have been in breach of the privacy and electronic communications regulations. Enacted, the bill came into effect as of 17th of December last year, the UK government having implemented Mrs Gibson's bill in full. Imposing fines on named company directors will have a huge impact on diminishing this scourge. There is still much important work to be done, though, in raising awareness and protecting people from all sorts of other scams and fraud. I look forward to seeing further developments and again congratulate Maurice Corey on bringing forward this debate. The last of the open debate contributions is from Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer, and I'd also like to thank Maurice Corey for bringing this important matter to Chamber for debate, as across my own constituency of Caithness, Sutherland and Ross, people are also being defrauded. In fact, just last week, a family contacted me for help, and they've been conned out a four-figure sum in an elaborate and very organised way that I'll go into in more detail later on. I'm sure many of us here today have helped. A lot of constituents have been victims of financial scams, Indeed, studies show that every 15 seconds, someone in the UK loses money to a scammer. And younger people often think that they are less likely to be hit by these scams, but in fact, this is not the case. Indeed, many scammers will develop particular techniques that are aimed more at young people. And as we've heard from Jackie Bailey, things like ticketing scams, as well as online and subscription traps. But there are no parts of Scottish society that are immune to financial scams, and we must work together to ensure that everyone is kept safe, but we should highlight how important it is that these scams are reported and that people know where to get help if they need it. And so we should be encouraging governments of all levels and local authorities to support organisations to inform and educate the public in keeping themselves safe. Citizens Advice Scotland, as has also been mentioned, have published a lot of very useful information and support for people to access to get help if they have been scammed and tips for how to prevent someone falling victim to one. And I would encourage all members, not just those here today in the chamber, to have a look at the information online and share it with their constituents. They also note the tools that some scammers use to entice their victims into parting with their money. Scammers will, also, will often create a feeling of obligation as they are aware that most people will tend to obey requests from authority figures. They also create a sense of personal consequence, as most people will tend to avoid anything that would result in some sort of punishment. They appeal to emotions and try to create a sense of urgency. As you will see from the example that I'm about to tell you, um, a young family in my constituency were recently contacted by who they believed and who they were told was HMRC demanding thousands of pounds in unpaid tax. The scammers informed my constituent that they would be immediately arrested and taken to court if they did not pay this money straight away. Now, my constituent lives in a particularly remote location, with their nearest bank being a two and a half hour round trip. But the scammers insisted that the money must be paid right away, so they allowed them to make a payment in an alternative method. And this is something that was completely new to me by purchasing vouchers at the local shop and then giving details of the vouchers to the scammers. Now, already we can see that these scammers have used the four classic tools by pressuring people into giving them money, consequence, obligation, urgency, and emotion. Now, you might say, well, fortunately, the local shop only had a proportion of the vouchers that my constituent was told to purchase. And so they decided to travel to a neighbouring village to purchase more to send. And luckily, whilst en route, they met a family member who they explained the situation to. And the family member realised it wasn't a legitimate um, way to collect this money. And they were prevented from any more money being lost. But I think that that goes to show, President Officer, that being a victim of a financial scam can happen to any one of us. 
And while some in society are certainly more vulnerable than others, we need to get the message out to everyone that organised criminals can and will target anyone, regardless of their age or health. So in conclusion, President Officer, I'd like to thank Citizens Advice Scotland and the many other organisations that support and help people who've fallen victim to a financial scam. And I would encourage anyone and everyone to speak up and report scams when they come across them. Thank you. I call Jamie Hepburn to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, President Officer. And can I uh, join with others and begin, uh, as uh, others have, uh, in thanking Maurice Corey for bringing uh, tonight's debate uh, forward? I, I believe this is uh, a very uh, important uh, debate for us uh, to have. Uh, we have a clear responsibility to all of our certain citizens, uh, particularly those who are uh, most vulnerable, to protect them from becoming a victim of uh, scamming uh, behaviour. I say we have a responsibility, and I do believe uh, uh, particularly to our most vulnerable citizens, but of course, as uh, Dick Lyle and Gail Ross a few moments ago uh, reminded us, any person can be uh, impacted by a scamming uh, behaviour, any one of us, uh, as Gail Ross said. So in that regard, it is important that we have uh, this debate uh, this evening. And, and the many uh, examples that have been mentioned uh, this evening demonstrate the, the distress and harm caused from scams. We'll all uh, be uh, aware of situations uh, that some of the people we each represent uh, have uh, been uh, impacted by. Indeed, many have been laid out uh, the, this evening. Uh, Kenny Gibson uh, and Jeremy Balfour were quite right, uh, of course, to remark that this is an issue that goes beyond the immediate financial uh, loss, which, of course, is the, the primary thing we think of uh, uh, when we talk and discuss and debate these matters. But, of course, there is uh, that substantial long-term impact on a person's well-being uh, as well, which we should, uh, of course, uh, remember. In terms of uh, the uh, prevalence of uh, this as, uh, as a problem, we are well aware of that. Jeremy Balfour asked about Scottish Government research uh, in that regard. I can say to him uh, and other uh, members uh, in the Chamber that uh, in March uh, last year, we uh, uh, commissioned ECOS to undertake a review of existing research and evidence uh, on the financial cost of scams to uh, the Scottish economy. And that was to try and identify and, and measure uh, preventative strategies designed to re reduce uh, their impact. So the research that he was suggesting has been uh, undertaken. If he or any uh, member would uh, like more uh, information, we're very happy to provide that if they uh, contact, uh, uh, contact me. Uh, the Scottish Government is uh, currently working with a, a range of partners to, to embed uh, cyber resilience within our education lifelong learning systems at, at all levels so that uh, all citizens have a, a fundamental awareness of cyber risk and how they can take basic but important uh, steps to reduce uh, that uh, risk. But of course, we know uh, that this isn't, uh, and has been uh, very eloquently set out by a range of members this evening, this isn't just uh, an issue that happens uh, online. Uh, and that's why we must uh, undertake uh, other activity as well. And uh, the Scottish Government has uh, provided Crime Stopper Scotland with uh, funding uh, last year uh, to uh, uh, support uh, and empower uh, people to uh, speak up uh, where they need to, uh, to uh, uh, help uh, prevent and solve crime, uh, to make communities safer uh, and reduce uh, the likelihood of, of criminal uh, behaviour. Uh, and in, uh, in particular, uh, they as an organisation are leading on the national doorstep uh, crime campaign, uh, which launches uh, next uh, uh, month. Uh, and that will work in partnership with uh, Police uh, Scotland, Neighbourhood Watch Scotland and Trading Standards with a particular focus on raising uh, awareness for the over 60s on the risk of bogus callers and uh, rogue uh, traders. Uh, and we do, uh, of course, think of this uh, often as an issue that affects older people in particular. But I thought uh, Jackie Bailey uh, and uh, Gail Ross were quite right uh, to highlight that this is an issue that impacts uh, young people uh, as well. Uh, through uh, partnership work, we will uh, continue to try and increase uh, consumer awareness of uh, scams. Citizens Advice uh, Scotland runs Scams Awareness uh, Month uh, uh, and undertake additional <coughs> scams uh, campaigning in June each year, working with local trading standards uh, teams throughout the country and the majority of uh, Citizens Advice Bureau uh, to help ensure that there is a uh, local activity. In uh, 2018, Citizens Advice Scotland, working with uh, Young Scott, again reminding us that this is an issue 
that impacts young people. Working with Police Scotland and many uh, local uh, authorities, uh, this it was a range of activity that gained a huge amount of uh, social media and local and national newspaper coverage in the delivery of what was a, a very successful uh, campaign. But, President, officer, we, we do need to do more than uh, education and awareness raising, as important as that is. It is also important to recognise how businesses uh, can play uh, a role uh, as well. And uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Finance, Economy uh, and Fair Work uh, was able uh, last year to help uh, support uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland launch uh, the Little Book of Cyber Scams Scotland a publication and their Cyber Fraud uh, Prevention Initiative, uh, which it was designed to try and ensure that vulnerable customers were better uh, protected. Uh, this uh, new system involving uh, Police Scotland, the banking sector and trading standards was uh, launched uh, in March of last year and prevented over £5 million pounds of fraud in 2018 and, uh, uh, and led to a number of arrests being uh, made. Most of the potential victims were over the age of 65 with uh, a range of different uh, scamming type uh, behaviour. Uh, the protocol kicks in when bank staff suspect a customer may be about to fall uh, victim to a scam, often when they are asked to withdraw an unusually large sum of money and the bank then alerts uh, police and officers attend the branch with a guaranteed priority response. That's the type of initiative that I commend and I think many other businesses can learn from. Just as this isn't only a matter for education and awareness, nor should we just look to business to take action, so too it must it we as an administration, but also collectively as parliamentarians. And uh, I was. Uh, yes, briefly. Um, Maurice Corey. Thank you, Deputy Prime Officer. It's very important. I think we sometimes miss the point about the importance of trading standards officers. And I've seen in my own area a great effectiveness being put on that. They are few and far between. Would you agree with me, Minister, that we would actually be better to get more finance into that particular focused sector? Because they are effective, they gain a lot of intelligence on the ground, and I have personally seen them in operation and been very effective in, in, uh, in Helensburg and Lomond, and particularly in the West Scotland region. Jamie Hepburn. I, I greatly value uh, the work of trading standards uh, officers. Uh, one of the uh, things I've been able to do is work with them very closely in a range of uh, activity that we uh, have undertaken as uh, an administration. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the, the initiative that we've undertaken uh, to ensure that people aren't being ripped off with uh, high delivery charges, for example, trading standards have an important role to play. I've uh, had the uh, pleasure to meet with uh, trading standards uh, officers' representatives recently to discuss more work that can be done together, and I'll always be very willing to, to meet with them to discuss uh, these matters. So I uh, absolutely recognise the important role uh, they play, and indeed uh, that's why we uh, provided funding uh, to Trading Standards Scotland of uh, £125,000 in 2017 for the, the purchase and rollout of call blocking uh, devices, which was something that Maurice Corrie was uh, mentioning the effectiveness of uh, that it has uh, itself uh, led to uh, the blocking of 150,000 uh, calls uh, and an estimated 171 scams being prevented with savings made of 604,000, uh, nearly 605,000 uh, pounds. So we will act as a government, we'll work with others as trading, uh, uh, such as trading uh, standards officers. I was also going to commend, and I still will because I think I've got some time uh, to do so, uh, Kenny Gibson and Ruth McGuire for the, the activity they've undertaken locally, emphasising the role that not only will we play as a government, but each of us individually can do as uh, individual parliamentarians, which I think is a way of reminding us that this is a shared agenda. We do collectively take very seriously the, the concern around uh, scams and let us resolve together to continue to undertake activity, to reduce this activity, to protect all of our citizens. That concludes the debate and this meeting is closed. <laughs>